So I've been teaching you the mitzvot over the last few times that I speak. We're going to continue them today. We're in the last book of the mitzvot, which is Devarim. And um, I realize that the narrative between the Greeks and Rome and the Europeans have told my people, I'm talking to my people, they've told my people that these mitzvot are archaic and they're said that they did not bring anybody to the goal in Hebrews. Therefore, the Greeks said, we're going to write a new narrative. We're going to write you a new religion. We're going to give you a new God. And we're going to tell you that these mitzvot have been done away with. As I said to you before, I can never again open my mouth and refer to the Most High in the narrative of calling him God or Lord. Can't do it, won't do it. I will never again associate the absolute all existence one with any terminology that is associated with idolatry. I'm going to say it again, because I want you to get this. I want you to hear this. Titles that speak to him that are tied to idolatry is not a good thing. And however unassuming and seemingly unimportant it is, still a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And I think I said this to you again last week or the last time I taught. I asked a question. How much cyanide does it take in a drop of water or your food to kill you? Over time. Over time. And then you die. And they do an autopsy. And they find out that for umpteen number of years, somebody has been dropping cyanide in your food. Now you're dead. The analogy that I'm giving you is to tell you that the Greek document is filled with poison. And its design is to kill you. And you don't have to take it from me. It's okay. Israel didn't take it from the prophets. And the prophets were sent by the Most High to speak to them. I'm not going to try to hide my calling. I was born as the firstborn son of my father. My father was the firstborn son of his father. In Hebraic terminology, that made him a Levite. My grandfather was a leader your terminology and Norman and our Western terminology, he was a pastor 
of people. The Hebraic terminology would have made him a Kohanim, a teacher of people. My father was, like my grandfather, a great man. And I don't have problems saying this. Even though I have progressed theologically and advanced beyond my father's knowledge, no way today I can stand in his shoes. So my father was the firstborn of my grandfather, made him a Levite. My father was a Kohanim, a pastor, who shepherded people. I am the firstborn son of my father and the only son of my father, as my father was the only son of his father. And today, I am also a Levite and a Kohanim. And because I am the overseer of the congregation, it makes me a Hagadol Kohanim in exile, not from the loins of Elzar or Aharon, but in this exile, I am a teacher of Torah to the people and acquiring the title. In retrospect and thought now <laughs> we learn a lot on we learn a lot on the journey I kind of wish that I would have never have adopted the title of rabbi but I am a Kohanim a teacher of Torah. With that, my job and my task, as was the task of Mashe, who was a prophet of the Most High, when the Most High spoke to him, he spoke to Israel, and he taught Israel these mitzvot. Davarim chapter 4. Now listen, Israel. Listen to the laws and rulings I am teaching you in order to follow them so that you will live, period. In the text, there's a semicolon. That acts as a period as the text goes on. Then you will go in and take possession of the land that Yahweh Eloheka of your fathers is giving you in order to obey the mitzvot of Yahweh Eloheka, which I am giving you. Do not, do not, do not add to what I'm saying and do not subtract from it. Verse 5. Look. I have taught you laws and rulings just as Yahweh my Elohim ordered me. What did he say he taught them? Laws and rulings just as Yahweh my Elohim taught me. So that you can behave accordingly in the land where you are going. Text goes on to possess. <laughs> We're in exile and we ain't possessing nothing. 
We're not possessing anything. We are subjugated to the raw the laws, the rules, and the orders of the nations to which we have been dispersed. I don't care how successful you are in this diaspora. Your success is filtered through the lens of your captors. Your success is defined by your willingness to play, function, and move by the dictates of your captors. And my sisters and brothers, that's what captivity is all about. However, while we are in this diaspora out of the land, our ability to turn back to the Most High is governed by the principles that are dictated by his mitzvot, his rulings, and his commandments. The nations can do whatever they choose to do. The nations don't have to honor the Most High's Sabbath. The nations do not have to govern themselves by the Most High's dietary laws. The nations can fornicate, be promiscuous, do whatever they want to do. Hebrew Israel can not. We're governed by these mitzvot that Moshe said that the Most High had given to him to teach to Hebrew Israel. The Most High, the absolute all existent one, the mighty one, who is defined by the Hebrew terminology El Elohim and Eloah, who has the name Yahweh, despises, hates. Hate is a strong word. But he absolutely abhors anything that is associated with idolatry and outside of the scope of what he's given the nation of Israel to operate and function. Every nation of people have a governance. Every nation has a governance. Every nation has laws and rules by which their people are to abide by in order to live in and be a part of the nation. And Israel is no different. So you say, well, we're not in our land. You weren't in your land when the Most High delivered you out of Mitzrayim and took you into the wilderness. You are the only people. We are the only people on the face of the earth that became a nation without first having a land. Ha <laughs> ha, how you like that? We're the first nation. We're the first people. And in this exile, 
while we're not in our land, we are still a nation of people. And he refers to us as a holy nation, a royal priesthood. How does the Most High see us? He still sees us as his people. I don't know, and I haven't found any rabbi, haven't found a Kohenim, haven't found anybody about, amongst the Messianic community, which are, I call them Hebristians. The reason I do that is because they still want to halt between they want to dance between two opinions. Which Ezekiel said, if Yah be Yah, serve him. If Baal be Baal, serve him. Oh, I'm going to say it every time I get a chance to. That's what prophets do. You can't worship across the street the God of the Greeks and then declare the Most High, the Absolute All-Existent One, which you refer to in that term, which I refuse to mention out of my mouth ever again, that references him to a mighty heathen deity <laughs> Because you don't know no better. That Elohim has spoken to us. And I'm going to ask you a question. Who told you that these mitzvot had been done away with? Who told you that? Oh, your captors. Your European captors. That nation that the Most High says in Obadiah he is going to destroy. Obliterate them. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Never to be remembered again. That nation told you that the Most High was a liar. If they told you that the Most High's misfolks and commandments have been done away with, they are lying on the Most High. The nerve, the gall, the unmitigated gall to call the one who said to me, I delivered you out of Mitzrayim. You are to have no other Elohim beside me. You are not to worship anything in the heavens, anything in the earth, not the sun, the moon, the stars. Said to me that he's a liar. I'm going to say it today because that's the way I feel. I'm pissed off. I'm angry. I'm angry. Because the one that I serve, the one that I love, can't lie. And he said in numbers, I am not a human that I should lie or change my mind. Whatever I have said, I will bring it to pass. And guess what? Nobody can legislate change what the Most High has put in place. I'm going to speak in the words of the young people. Wait for it. Wait for it.
I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't even care if people in my family don't like me. I'm at a place in my life where I'm not here to be liked. I'm here to speak forth the words of my Creator who loves me unconditionally. And that as long as I walk and I teach these, I'm in a good place. I can say to you better than Ray Lewis could ever say on a football field. There is no weapon that can be formed against me. Not your tongues. Not your bad mouthing. That can be formed against me that can prosper. Prophets, they stood in the midst of Israel fearless, 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 and they proclaimed what the Most High told them to say to a stiff necked, rebellious, hard headed. And they accepted whatever in life their plight was. And they were able to go to sleep knowing that their soul was eternally in the hands of the one who called them. I know that I was called by the Most High to do exactly what I'm doing in this present day. I know that. I've borne the hardship of liars. I've borne the hardship of being called a hypocrite. I've borne the hardship of watching the ministry and people More in the hardship of you not talking to me. And I'm here today with a pure, clean conscience. That as long as I open my mouth and I teach those mitzvahs, Can't say what I want to say. <laughs> Can't say what I want to say. I've said too much already. I'll be here until the Most High says otherwise. To the mitzvot, 
The European Oxenazi Jews say there's 613. We're at 498. I don't know if we're going to make 613. They have added mitzvotes on top of mitzvotes within text. In some places, in some degrees, that's probably okay. But the overall scope of it, we're at 498. 498 today, we'll finish. We'll start with 477. Ibarim, chapter number 20, verses 2 through 4. The obligation to appoint a Kohanim to speak with the soldiers before they go to battle. When you are about to go out to battle, call name is to come forward and address the people. He should tell them, listen, Israel, you are about to do battle against your enemies. Don't be faint-hearted or afraid. Don't be alarmed or frightened by them. Because Yahweh Eloheka is going with you to fight on your behalf against your enemies and give you a victory. I said that this was a misfold that would be done in the land. I wish I could have marched and said in the company of Martin Luther King. And I wish I could have told him, Martin, we are talking to Hebrew Israelites. We're marching for justice and going to battle against our enemy in this nation. I wish I could have told him, Martin, if only we can get our people to turn back to the Most High, accept his most votes, and come under his banner. Yahweh, our Elaheka, is going with us to fight on our behalf against our enemies and give us the victory. I am going to tell you all something today that will frighten the bejesus out of the nations. If ever, if ever, if ever, Hebrew Israel in diaspora rises up and turns back to the Most High, it will be over. Over. No more oppression. No more calling us niggas. No more shooting us in the back. No more oppression from the nations. Because our Elohim will give us the victory. Where is it? Where is it? In our obedience. The guy across the street said greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. Seems to me he missed the mark. Missing the mark is missing Torah. Because I heard 
מה שישי? If you will obey these rulings and these mitzvot that I am teaching you and obey them, you will live long in the land that I am giving you. Come on, choir. I hear you. Whose report we believe? We shall believe the report of Yahweh. I ain't using that term. And the robes just be dancing. But you don't believe the report because you haven't returned to what the Most High said. Number 478. The obligation in Dream chapter 20, verse 10, to follow the Torah's instructions for conducting a discretionary war. When you advance on a town to attack it, first offer it terms of peace. That's across the street too. They took it from here. When you go into a city across the street says you go two by two. When you get there, you are to offer them the message of peace. If they will not accept it, this is not in our text. This is their text. You're supposed to shake the dust off your feet and go to the next city and leave it with them. Hebrew texts don't say that. They, they, they do not add to and do not subtract from what I've said. Most High said, offer them terms of peace. Before you do what? Before you annihilate them. Mitzvah number 479. I, I have to do this to make the discretionary difference between Hebrew and the nations. Once again, the nations can do whatever they want to do, but we cannot. Devarim chapter 20, verse 19. The obligation not to destroy fruit trees even during a siege. When in making war against a town in order to capture it, you lay siege to it for a long time. You are not to destroy its trees, cutting them down with an axe. You can eat their fruit, but don't cut them down. And the question is, what do the trees do to you? You know, don't cut something down that hasn't done anything to you. You're here to lay siege to a people who have oppressed you and uh, whom I have declared to you, you are supposed to destroy. This will happen in the land. Mitzvah number 480. Dabarim chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. I didn't put all this up there, but it's the obligation to perform the decapitation of a calf to atone for certain murders. This procedure can only be done in the land. This particular mitzvot is born out of the idea that a murder has taken place in the city. Nobody saw it but the murderer. It's kind of like today, we got murder, nobody knew what did, who did it. The Most High says to Israel, when you come up on the individual or the person who has been murdered, in order to protect Israel, you are to take this calf down by a stream of water and you are to decapitate it in the presence so that the city where the murder has taken place 
can be atoned for. It's right there in these verses. You can read them. It can only be done in the land. Uh, yeah. If we took a cow down to the river and decapitated, we'd be arrested for animal cruelty <clears throat> in this exile. Mitzvah number 481, Dabarim chapter 21, verses 10 through 13, the obligation toward a woman of beautiful form captured in war. When you go out to war against your enemies and Yahweh Elk hands them over to you and you take prisoners, and you see among the prisoners a woman who looks good to you, and you feel attracted to her. It says you feel attracted to her. It didn't say she felt she felt attracted to you. And you want her as your wife. You are to bring her home to her house where she will shave her head I remember, <laughs> I remember distinctly the many saints meetings that I attended in my father's church when the young ladies were starting to feel their, their fashion expertise and getting their hair cut. I remember all, all the fury that came out against women cutting their hair. But I got to keep this in perspective because this is about going to war with the nations. And I find a woman that is that I'm attracted to, then say she's attracted to me, and I take her home to marry, then that woman of the nation has to go through this. Cut her fingernails. Oh my oh my goodness. I don't think the women of the nation wants to cut their nails. We don't want to cut ours. Remove her prison clothing. And she will stay there in her house, mourning her father and mother for a full month, after which you may go in to have sexual relations with her and be her husband, and she will be your wife. What's, what's, the, what's the protocol for marriage? You will go in to have sexual relations with her and be her husband. And she will be your wife. <clears throat> this mitzvot right here is going to tie into another mitzvot in chapter number 22. Mitzvot number 42, Dabarim 21, 14, the prohibition to sell a woman taken in war. In the event that you lose interest in her, you are to let her go wherever she wishes. But you may not sell her for money or treat her like a slave because you have humiliated her. This is also in the land. Dabarim chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. The obligation to give the inheritance to the firstborn son. In this westernized world that we live in, we don't have the aspect of having been married, having been married to more than one woman. But in Hebrew Israel, they had multiplicity of wives of which uh, King Solomon broke the record. 
he had more than anybody. And they caused him great grievous pain. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other unloved, and both the loved and the unloved wives have borne him children, and if the firstborn son is the child of the unloved wife, when it comes time to pass out his inheritance onto his sons, he may not give the inheritance due the firstborn to the son of the loved wife in place of the son of the unloved wife, who is in fact the firstborn. No. He must acknowledge as firstborn the son of the unloved wife by giving him a double portion of everything he owns, for he is the first fruits of his manhood, and the right of the firstborn is his. I'm not gonna give him my my first fruits. I'm not gonna give him my inheritance. He's gonna share it with his mama. I don't like his mama. I don't want her to have nothing. Most high says, get over it. Because this is my rule. And this is my commandment to you. Oh, you can have one, two, three wives, but if you have a child that's born born by the first by the first born to you, you can hate her all you want to. But that birthright better get to where it needs to go. Because if you break the commandment, mm, in Israel, breaking the commandment would result in you being flogged. I'm not sure what the most I would do in this case. I think that under, I don't know. I don't know. You take to take you out in the cold, and the cold and would either flog you, or you'd be whew, demised. And this is anywhere we live in the land. The first fruits are supposed to go to the firstborn son. <clears throat> Miss vote number four eighty three. Not on anybody's list obligation to discipline a rebellious son. If a man has a stubborn rebellious son who will not obey what his father or mother says, and even after they discipline him, he still refuses to pay attention to them, then his father and mother are to take hold of him, bring him to the leaders of the town at the gate of the place, and say to the leaders of the town, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He doesn't pay attention to us. Lives wildly, gets drunk. Then all the men of his town are to stone him to death. And this way, you will put an end to such wickedness among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. There is no record. <laughs> there is no record in Torah or in the history of Israel ever having to have fulfilled this mitzvah in the land. Mitzvah number 484, Dabarim chapter 21, verses 20 through 23, the obligation toward a capital crime. If someone has committed a capital crime and is put to death, been hung on a tree, his body is not to remain all night on the tree, but you must bury him the same day because a person who has been hanged has been cursed by Elohim. Mm. Mm. So that you will not defile your land which Yahweh Eloheka is giving you to inherit. Hmm. 
I know they wrote a disclaimer for this across the street. He was made a curse for you. No. 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 Not at all. He was found guilty of a capital crime. The Marine, chapter 13. If a dreamer or a prophet comes to you and prophesies to you and leads you away from your Eloheka to serve another Elohim, that dreamer or prophet is to be put to death. Capital crime. Capital crime. I want you to hear the words that an individual who was a ruler in Jerusalem at the time said, and Pilate must have known something about the Hebrew law. Because Pilate said, do to him according to to your law. Well, the law says that you are supposed to stone that individual to death. But since Hebrew Israel was under the dictates of Rome, they had to do to him according to where they were so they hung him. And yes, he became a curse. <laughs> oh, well, that's been done. No, it has not. If I were to come to you and start telling you stuff outside the parameters of Torah, you have the right to put me to death. Cut me off. Away with you. Can't kill me. We're in exile. You go to jail. You're charged with a capital offense. But in literal application, you can say to me, Rabbi, you got to go. We're cutting you off from the community. Don't want to hear nothing you got to say. Mitzvah number 484. 484, yeah. Mitzvah number 45, Dabarim, chapter 22, verse 1. The obligation to return a lost object. You are not to watch your brother's ox or sheep strain and behave as if you hadn't seen it. You must bring it back to him, to your brother. Now, this applies to anywhere in the land. So we're not necessarily talking about oxes and sheep. If I find something that belongs to one of my brothers, now who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? We're talking about Hebrew Israel. If I find something that's lost by the nations, it's mine. It's mine. But I can't treat Hebrew Israel that way. If I know what I found belongs to a Hebrew Israelite, then my obligation is to return it to him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't you 
just love the most high. 486, Dalaram chapter 22, verse 3. The prohibition to ignore a lost object. You are to do the same with his donkey, his coat, anything else of your brother's that he lost, that he lost, loses. If you find something he lost, you must not ignore it. So if I find something that belongs to you, and I know it is, I can't ignore it. I need to gather it and try to find its rightful owner. 488, Dot Ramos 22 5, prohibition for a woman to wear men's clothing and vice versa. This is everywhere we live. A woman is not to wear men's clothing, and a man is not to put on women's clothing. For whoever does these things is detestable to Yahweh. Now, I want to make a distinct difference between two words. If you look up the word detestable and you look up the word abomination, the word abomination carries with it a much stronger definition than does detestable. And that's the reason why I have to look at when I read texts like this, I have to look at the Hebrew text as opposed to the Greek text because the Greek text uses abominable, which means he hates it. Detestable does not, does not render the same definition. Detestable means that he doesn't like it. Now, Does the word phrasing, I don't like, is it softer than the word hate? When you say you hate somebody, that's a very strong word. The Most High says, I don't like it. It's not pleasing to me. So in all the texts that you read, And fundamental Christians, bless their heart. No. No, I'll take that back. I don't want to bless their heart. They use this word abomination very loosely. They breathe fire and brimstone on the LGBT community. But yet, for Thanksgiving and on the abominable day of Christmas, they will have on their table a big, big, fat piece of ham. Which in their text, which in their text, the Most High says, in their text, he says, it's an abomination. I hate it. In our text, he says, I don't like it. So, I'm trying to figure out how do you distinguish on your table, let me put it in a more, in a more descriptive way. Why don't you just invite some LGBT people to your house for Christmas dinner? then you'll have both abominations in your house at the same time. And I personally, as a Hebrew rabbi, on a corny, I don't have a problem with the community. The Most High says, I just don't like it. You hate it.
I'm going to talk about them. Because they talk about the Most High's Word every weekend across the street, up on the hill in Roseville. I'm going to tell you. You hate everything about my Creator, my Elohim, that you disagree with because it gets in your way until something comes up out of my text that you can use on your platform to spread your political agenda of hate. I've never done this before and I shouldn't do it today. Come on, Yahweh. Oh. Mm. Not nah, got nothing to do with this miss vote. Let's move on. Dealing with the word of abominable and, and detestable. Let's move on. You can't hate something in one aspect of text and agree with it in another aspect because it doesn't fit where you are. You can't hate the most high dietary laws When he gives us what it is that we are supposed to, well, wait a minute. Uh, no. Let's run that back. You know what? Please excuse me. I am talking to the wrong people. I don't know why it is I'm standing in my own chancel area trying to chastise people from the nation. I don't know why I'm doing it. Other than to say to my people, come out from among them and be separate. Because when you sit amongst them, then you become the product of their theological premise and you're outside of the scope of the covering of the Most High. Which means That according to the prophets, you will not survive. Ooh, Father, help me. Miss phone number 489, Dalaran chapter 22, verse 6 and 7. The prohibition to take the mother bird with her young. If as you are walking along, you happen to see a bird's nest in a tree or on the ground with chicks or eggs, and the mother bird is sitting on her chicks or her eggs, you are not to take the mother with the chick. You must let the mother go. You may take the chicks for yourself so that things will go well with you and you will prolong your life. Now, I didn't look into the meaning of this particular mitzvot, but it has a voluminous meaning. We'll cover it when we come back and we start breaking these mitzvot down that we're teaching along the way. Mitzvot number 490, Dalaran chapter 22, verse 8. The obligation to remove hazards. When you build a new house, you must build a low wall around your roof, otherwise someone may fall from it and you will be responsible for their death. Now, this particular misfolds is everywhere that we live. 
Because even in our current society, we're supposed to build things and protect people from hazards, which is the reason why our buildings have certain things around them to keep people from falling off and, and hurting themselves. So now, when you tell me that we're not under the law, <laughs> you are, and it's a part of your of our civilization to not build things that are hazardous. If you build a building that is hazardous and somebody falls off of it and they know it, guess what happens? You're liable for a lawsuit. So the Most High has given us this law to protect ourselves. Mitzvah number 491, Nahum chapter 22, verse 8, prohibition to plant a vineyard with mixed seeds. You're not to sow two kinds of seed between your rows or vines. If you do, both the two harvest crops and the yield from the vines must be forfeited. You are not to plow with an ox or a donkey. Verse number 2210, the prohibition to plow with two species of animals. You are not to plow with an ox or a donkey anywhere that we live. Verse number 493, verse 22 and 11, the prohibition to wear clothing with two kinds of thread. You are not to wear clothing woven with two kinds of thread. Wool and linen together. Hmm. Guess that wipes out a lot of the clothes we buy, isn't it? Because a lot of the clothes that we buy are woven with two kinds of thread. I wear wool and I wear cotton. I try to stay away from other materials that don't meet this particular misfold. Obligation, Mitzvah number 494, Devarim 2212, the obligation to make zitzis. Now, this particular Mitzvah, which I tried to explain to you all, does not coincide with Torah, what we do doesn't coincide with Torah. We do it, and those of you that honor it, we do it to try to honor what the Most High has said to us in this exile. But there's a word in the text that says where these chords are supposed to be. My belt loops are not four corners of the garment. You are to make for yourselves twisted cords on the four corners of the garments you wrap around yourself. We don't have a wrap. And I'm not saying to you that you shouldn't or can't wear zitzits on your belt straps. I'm just trying to let you know that if you don't, you're not in violation because you don't have four corners on your garment. I'm sorry. These are not four corners. They are belt loops. If we were going to wear them anywhere at all on the four corners of our garment, it would have to be at the base of the hem of our pants to make any sense. Now, and we'd have to wear a we'd have to wear a wrap. If we didn't do this, we'd have to wear a wrap. And on the wrap, at the end of the wrap of the garment would be these twisted cords. Now When you see a garment worn by the Kohanims of Israel, 
their zitzits are on the corners of their garment. I'm not saying we can't. We can. Just like the Oxenazis, it's supposed to be wrapped around your arm and they got this leather strap all wrapped up around their arm. Come on, people. When Joseph went down into Mitzrayim, the text said that Joseph looked just like the Egyptians. His brother didn't even know who he was. The difference that Joseph made in the community in which that he was became the viceroy of was that he demonstrated by virtue of Torah in him wisdom, knowledge, which his captors had to recognize put him in the position of being a viceroy in Egypt. He had the hat, he had the clothes, he looked like an Egyptian, but he talked like a Hebrew. You following my drift? We can look like the nations because that's where we are. Oh, most high. But when we open our mouth to speak, we should speak with the wisdom that the Most High has given us. Because the Most High has said to Moses, what great nation is there like you that have heard the voice of the Most High and live? What nation? You've Heard, and you open your mouth and you speak with wisdom. There is no wisdom coming out of our mouths when we agree with the protocol of the nation to which we have been exiled. Even to act like them. That's not wisdom. It is not wisdom to hate your brother or dislike your brother. When you've joined with Hebrew Israel, that's not Torah. That's you, because you don't like something. I like Mashe. I love him. He's my teacher. Mashe is my teacher. What do I like about him? He told Israel what they were supposed to do, and he left it with them. He went on about his business. And I'm going to tell you what he said, and I'm going to leave you to deal with him. <laughs> and here's the interesting problem. The Most I said to Israel, so lo, you have tempted me these ten times. And I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> In our tempting the Most High, have you been keeping count? You don't even know. You don't even know how close to 10 you are. And if something has happened to you that is not like right, and he brings judgment on you, now you're wondering, why is this happening to me? You might want to go back and check yourself and see where it is that maybe you have just pushed his button beyond the limit time that he is willing to put up with it. Mitzvah number 9, 495. Now we're getting into something and we're getting ready to close. This particular mitzvot here, Dabarim chapter 22, verses 13 and 14, I don't know 
if I put it all in there, I better pull it up on my trusty device here and find my glasses because I may have to read it all to explain it. Okay. If a man marries a woman, has sexual relations with her, this particular misvote probably should end right there with a semicolon. And here's the reason why. The aspect of accomplishing this requires a ketabon. A marriage contract. This here consummates this. So when this happens, when this happens right here, you have taken a wife. How do I know that? Because when I look at marriage in the scripture of all the Hebrew sons of Israel, and one in particular that stands out in my mind is Yitzchak. Text says that Yitzchak took Rachel, Rachel, Rebecca, huh? Rebecca. Rebecca took Rebecca. He saw her coming. She fell off a horse. He went and got her. They met. They talked. The text says he took her into his mother's tent and she became his wife. The only way she could become his wife is by having a sexual relationship. In our court system today, any woman who enters into a contract, a ketoban, with a man, and he doesn't perform this act right here, the marriage is not consummated, and she can go to court and have the marriage annulled. In our land today. That can happen. Having come to dislike her brings false charges against her, defames her character by saying, I married this woman, but when I had intercourse with her, I did not find the evidence that she was a virgin, you liar. What's the, what's the charge? False charge. Because in Hebrew Israel, daddy got to bring the proof. Oh my goodness. Now, <laughs> you got to think about this, okay? You got to think about this. The girl's parents and this is something that young girls experience. They wake up one morning to a surprise. <clears throat> Every young lady has it. They wake up to a surprise. <clears throat> or in the midst of their day, they wake up to a surprise. What is this? What is this? Why am I why am I bleeding? What is this? Mother or wise woman that explains to the young girl that she is now experiencing 
her menstrual cycle. Nida. Nida. So look, so listen, 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 listen here, listen here. The father and the parents have to keep that evidence to prove this false charge to be error. Let's read on. Then the girl's father and mother are to take the evidence of the girl's virginity to the leaders of the town at the gate. Here's the proof. My daughter was a virgin. Let's vote number 496. 497, the prohibition to bring false charges of marriage. The girl's father will say to the leaders, I let my daughter marry this man, but he hates her. Now, he hates her for whatever reason. And because he hates her, he brings his false charges against her. That he didn't find evidence of her virginity. Now, when you marry a virgin, you know she's a virgin. Because there are certain physical aspects that define the first time a woman enters into a sexual act. And he says, I didn't find that evidence. They will lay the cloth before the town leaders. The leader of that town are to take the man, punish him, Find him two and a half pounds of silver shekels. Silver is the aspect of redemption. Which they will give to the girl's father. Because he has publicly defamed a virgin of Israel. Uh oh. Uh oh. So you hate her, do you? You hate her? Misfold number 498. The obligation of the defamer to remain married to his wife forever. So you hate her? You better figure out how to get along with her. Because she will remain his wife and he is forbidden from divorcing her as long as he lives. Hold it. Hold it. Now we got to go back somewhere. If a man... Is married to two wives, and one he loves, and the other one he hates. So he gets married to another woman because he hates this one. But this one here bears him a son, the one he hates. We go back to the mystical that says, Well, too bad, buddy. Your inheritance has to go to the unloved wife if she bore you the firstborn son. Well, my friends, that's 21 mitzvot in the book of Davarim. We have some more to go. We conclude with those. And I say to you, in response to your question, why are we doing this? There is a text in the book of Kings that tells Hebrew Israel, if you don't live your life according to these mitzvahs, what I'm giving you, you are to be put to death. Now, I know in this Western world, 
that we're not going to be put to death. But I'm not preparing for this life. Everything that I'm teaching in relation to these mystical is part of this life. But I'm teaching you this so that you will be prepared for the life to come. Oh, there is another life. And it's not going to be done in the Shemayim, in the heaven. It will be carried out in the land. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, speaks about the revivification from the dust. Hebrew Israel that is in the grave righteous meets the criteria for to be invited to the land will be revivicated from the land from the, from the dust we will all meet up back in the land what land oh Africa the most has land of, of creation and we shall dwell there with him once again and we will begin once again to regurgitate learn understand these mitzvot in a much better way. Don't forget, the book is out in defense of the Messiah. You can get it on Amazon. So, it's a very good book. If I say so myself. My daddy always said it's a poor dog who won't wag his own tail. We also have our podcast Reach it by downloading Podbean or on any place where you listen to podcasts. Hebrews in exile. And I say to you, Yerarekaka, Yahweh be Ishmaraka, Yahir, Yahweh Pernava Leka, Bekanuka, Yasa Yahweh Pernava Leka, Bayasham, Baka, Shalom. Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine on you and show you his favor. May Yahweh lift up his face toward you and give you shalom.